Everybody, Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Tuesday on the show. I'm still testing positive for COVID. So I'm in a fabulous mood here today. And boy, we got a lot to talk about. Oh, man, I get to do a... So I think it's the first time I'm doing a raw report racked with COVID, so that should be fun. We'll talk about that here today on the show. We'll talk about Edge turning babyface. He's been kicked out of the group that he started by a guy who was kicked out of a group that he started. That was ironic. Talk about the return of John Cena, because you know we need babyfaces, so anybody well over the age of 40 is in line to be top WWE babyface at this point. Tony Storm talks about how she was crushed, her love for wrestling destroyed by WWE. We've got uh, King of Pro Wrestling stipulations for the upcoming match, plus the full lineup for uh, for the show that's coming up on my birthday, in fact, New Japan Dominion, June 12th. You can send your gifts now if you'd like, everybody. We've got uh, Hell in a Cell SmackDown Go Home ratings. We have ratings for AW Rampage, which uh, was back to its normal time slot and did not do a good number. We'll tell you about that. Plus, uh, tonight is everyone's favorite show. At least I'm stuck in quarantine and can watch. Actually, I think now technically it's isolation. Yeah. It's quarantine when you're negative, but when you're positive, it's isolation. It's exactly the same. They just change the words to make you feel like you're in prison. But anyway, in isolation tonight, I'll be watching NXT 2.0. We can talk about that tomorrow. That will be very fun. And uh, and so much more. If you want text, it's 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Mike Semper, VV joins us after the break. Wrestling Observer Live. Um, mm -mm -mm. <sighs> Dealing with the doctors, are you? I hear from one more internet doctor. I'm going to be really angry. Well, they know in their gut what's, what's best for you. Hmm. Hey, listen. What's up? Mm, nothing really. All right, let's talk about John Cena's return. <laughs> Come back on Raw June twenty seventh. I got to build up a head of steam for the Raw report because I really, I really uh, used most of my best material last night with Dave. I hit my <laughs> wall on this stupid show. This show is so dumb. Well, like my, uh, I, I, I've come to kind of a weird conclusion right here, which is like, you know, a lot of people, uh, and these are like some smart people actually, like uh, Brian Danielson. Uh, you know, he. Uh, he, like, thinks Vince is really smart. <laughs> he had a book where he, like, wrote down all of Vince's wisdom. It's the guy that was the smartest guy in the Ring of Honor locker room when they had, like, an IQ test. Well. And I'm watching this, and I watch this show all the time, and I, I, I'm just like, oh, what? Now, now, uh, now, here's, here's what I've, uh, it's, it, Vince is a very complicated man. You want to hear my speech about Vince McMahon and, and his competency with this business? Sure. Okay. So uh, he used to be a genius for sure, all right? At uh, 76, things are different, all right? Yeah. But, but, you know, I, I can kind of understand what Brian Danielson's talking about because uh, the thing that will always stick with me is uh, – you guys remember when, when Roman Reigns, they wanted him to be the top babyface, but they wanted to make sure that he was cheered. It was very important to them that he got cheered in the role as, as top babyface. And he kept getting booed, all right? Now, Vince came up with one idea after another to get this guy cheered. And if you really, if you really break it down, like, none of them worked, okay? But they were actually extremely clever ideas. He had all of these ideas to psychologically manipulate the fans. And on paper, like, they were all good ideas. But in, you know, there's a lot of things that are good ideas on paper. But in reality, they just don't pan out. And, uh, and they didn't. But, man, I saw some of this stuff that he did, and I was like, this bloke is clever. Like, he's really thinking about this. He's, he's you know, there's something here. 
But then, you know, it's just like these fans were determined. Like, no matter what, here's the thing. The fans were like, they had their minds made up. It doesn't matter. We're going to boo this guy no matter what, okay? If he would have tried these ideas with this current WWE audience that is total stand-up for WWE and they don't hijack nothing, all of these ideas would have worked. They would have worked great, okay? But anyway, I've also I've also noticed that, uh, and don't get me wrong, it's not perfect, okay? But if if you give Vince a card for Money in the Bank, like if there's a card and these are all the matches, like he can do television to build to uh to that show some of it's good some of it's bad a lot of it's your usual tropes and everything like that but he can do it all right what this guy cannot do is like conclude one story and then start another story he just can't like i'm looking at that show last night and like everything he's coming up with for the next show it's like it's the same things we've seen a million times well the usos are going to lose but it's going to be via count out. So who could possibly, I mean, God, who could possibly believe that the Street Profits are going to beat the Usos? No one on this planet. For the women, it's like every, every single time. Well, we need a challenger for the women. Let's do a random multi-woman match. Bro, I've seen this like three times in the last three weeks. This is the best you can come up with. This is the best you can come up with to find a challenger for Bianca Belair. For the 50th time, let's just do a random multi-woman match and somebody is going to win. It's like they finish off this deal with Bobby Lashley, Omos, and MVP. And then where, where are we going? Well, Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler come out and push MVP off the ramp. You know, you always start a story. It's like, if you're going to write an article, who, what, when, where, and why? Bro, I saw that and I was like, who, what, when, where, and why? What? Oh, I can't wait to see Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler versus MVP and Omos. The most completely, absolutely random thing I've ever seen in my lifetime. And it just happened. There's no reason for it. There was no, bill, nothing. There was no seeds planted back then. I'm like, okay, cool. Edge. And the funny thing is, like, I've been saying for weeks now, Edge is so much better as a babyface than this goofy thing they've been giving him with the Judgment Day. So, by the grace of God, like, they, they've they turned him back babyface. But how did they do it? Well, so, they had a Judgment Day match at the pay-per-view. And in the match, Edge pinned Finn Balor. This led to the two people with Edge deciding, we'd rather be with Finn Balor than Edge. <laughs> what? Bros, think for like five, one guy thinking for five seconds can tell you that what should have happened was Edge should have been about to get the win at the show, but his two hench people screw up and cost him the match. Finn Balor gets the win. And then the two people blame Edge for sucking, even though it was their fault. Then you have some sympathy for Edge. They're so stupid that they're like, well, you know, if Edge wins, but then they turn on Edge, well, you know, people are going to feel sympathy for Edge. Do you guys know anything about sympathy? I'm going to do an analogy here, okay? Now, in my analogy, I want to make this very clear. In my, anal my, my analogy, I'm going to say that a dog gets poisoned, but... You know, at the end of the day, the dog doesn't die. You know, you take the dog to the vet and the dog feels better, okay? But the dog needs to be poisoned for this analogy. If you have a dog, Mike, okay, and you invite, and you got two people that watch the dog. Okay. One of the people is like, you know, they're, they don't know what's going on. They don't know anything about dogs. And so they innocently, the dog's hungry, and so they innocently give the dog a Hershey's bar. Dogs aren't supposed to eat chocolate, right? No. So the dog gets horribly poisoned, and you end up having to rush the dog to the vet. And, like, the person that did it feels so bad about it. They didn't know. They didn't mean to. Okay? But then there's another person 
And it's like, you know, maybe that person had some sort of issue and you helped that person with that issue. But that person is so ungrateful that they deliberately poison your dog. OK, well, which which person are you going to have sympathy for? You're going to have sympathy for the person that accidentally didn't know what they were doing and they they did something and they felt terrible about it. That I know this is like a horrible analogy, but that's like what we're talking about here with this Judgment Day thing. Well, it's like we're, we're supposed to yes. feel bad for Edge because the two people he's with in storyline are stupid. We're supposed to feel bad for him. We should feel bad for him because the two person, the two people he was with, deliberately poisoned him, or like they're deliberately out to get the guy or whatever. Instead, it was like they're in a match. And then, like, Edge is victorious, but they're so dumb they want to get rid of him for the guy that we don't feel sympathy for people who are, because people are dumb. We feel sympathy for a guy because people screwed him because they're mean. I don't know. God help me. Does anybody see what I'm saying here? I usually don't feel sympathy for dumb people. You know, I, I don't. I don't feel sympathy for I, Edge. I pulled a Daniel. I was so brilliant that no one even knows what I'm talking about. God, I have no sympathy for Damian Priest when Finn Balor. I don't know who the vet is. I don't know. God, I don't know if it's AJ or whoever. Well, Brian, honestly, if you would have had a ring alarm system, you would have found out which person was the one who actually. Don't even get me started on that commercial. <laughs> God, I hope it plays next. <laughs> I'm going to do the Raw report after this break. I just got to get it out of my system. Get it out of your system, yes. I already spent too much time yelling. You know how many people watch this show every day and get mad that I yell? Where have you been since 1999? Back in a moment, Observer Live. Observer.com. I'm going to do the Raw report so everyone get out of my way. This show opened up with a Cody Rhodes promo where he came out and... He's the biggest baby face on the history of the planet Earth. And he's crying and they're chanting, thank you, Cody. And they're doing Cody chants. And he's selling his arm huge. And he's doing his, his singing thing with one arm. And uh, finally, Seth's music hits. And Seth comes out and says, listen, I still don't like you. But you beat me three times. And I respect you. And your father would be proud of what happened last night. And he shakes Cody's hand. He limps out of the ring, not doing his dancing or his stupid laugh or anything. Dan he walks out of the ring. He goes backstage, and Cody keeps, you know, pumping up the fans. I love you. He kisses the fans and the whole nine yards. He starts heading to the back, and this diabolical Seth comes out, hits him in the back with a sledgehammer, tears his shirt off. You see the bruising everywhere. He beats on him as these idiot security guys just stand there like morons. And uh, that's the end of Cody for a while. And the key was that Cody, before he got beaten up again, was suggesting that he might be back in four weeks to win the Money in the Bank contract so that he could get his championship match. Because that's the whole story of Cody, is he wants to get this title. So uh, this was the best thing on the show. And uh, the show was all downhill from there. So uh, I guess I can continue on. To uh, Dana Brooke beat Becky Lynch for the... Are you... Bros, dude, Becky Lynch. Do you guys know who Becky Lynch is? I do. Becky Lynch is in a championship match the night before, okay? Yeah. She has the match won, but the pin is stolen from her, okay? So now they have another random women's match in the main event to determine a number one contender. And even though she had the win the night before but was screwed, oh, she's not in this match. No, she's in the opener for no reason against Dana Brooke. So the match starts, all the 24-7 nerds run out, and they're going all crazy in the melee, in the melee, Dana Brooke rolls up and pins Tozawa. She's now the 24-7 champion. Becky's like, dude, what is going on here? I challenge you right now for that 24-7 title. So 
It is, in fact, Becky Lynch versus Dana Brooke for the 24-7 title. Asuka's music hits. Becky is distracted. Dana Brooke rolls up and pins Becky Lynch to retain the 24-7 title. Bro, all you nerds out there listening right now, none of you, none of you had the balls in the prediction contest to predict that Becky Lynch would face Dana Brooke for the 24-7 title and get pinned. Dude, I would have made you a plaque the size of this house if you would have predicted that and won. But no, none of you were in a contest where you're encouraged to say something crazy None of you came up with something that nutty. Then we have a Miz TV segment where Riddle comes out. You guys know Riddle? Yeah, Riddle was in the main event of the previous pay-per-view, and he was pinned in the middle of the ring by Roman Reigns. Riddle then went on to get a, a championship match with Shinsuke Nakamura against the Usos on Friday, and he also got pinned in that match. Well, now he comes out and he decides, I want a championship match against Roman Reigns. So, of course, you know, he's going to get a championship match. So they end up uh, with Maurice out there, and they talk about, uh, speaking of balls, uh, Riddle goes, you have tiny balls. I was so caught off guard. This was the second best thing on the show. I thought they were going to do one of their usual WWE things where they do like some euphemism or whatever. I laughed. I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed at Riddle's delivery. And anyway, uh, then Riddle gets attacked by Ciampa. Because, of course, why not? And then we never see Chomp again, like we haven't for weeks. And then uh, Riddle faces The Miz, and uh, he tears his pants off. Miz is getting heat on Riddle in his underwear. Maurice throws in the purse, and uh, Miz tries to use it, but Riddle avoids it. It's the RKO and wins. So now for sure he's in line for a championship match because, you know, he beat The Miz in his underwear. We had the Street Profits versus the Usos, and uh, no one's allowed to beat the Usos, which leads to programs where no one believes that anyone can actually win the belts from the Usos, so nobody cares. So we have a championship contenders match. If the Street Profits can beat the Usos, they can get a championship match. So they have a 16-minute match where about 14 minutes is them just beating incessantly on the Street Profits. Finally, the Street Profits make a comeback. They end up outside. The Street Profits beat barely beat the count they win via count out okay so if you haven't subscribed to peacock yet we got an extra you know five ten bucks lying around you can pay your money so hopefully you'll see the street profits beat the usos via count out in a championship match because we know that can happen a Bobby Lashley segment, Theory came down, they had a flexing contest, Lashley wanted a title match, Theory said you don't deserve it, and so uh, he didn't get it. Veer faced Dominic Mysterio, they went nine minutes, Veer beat on him for nine minutes, Dominic got a short comeback. Veer killed him. Veer went to put him in his move to finish him clean in the middle of the ring, and Rey Mysterio ran in and drop-kicked Veer for the DQ because these damn Mysterios are the most, the worst sports imaginable. You know when you tell your kids, be a good sport? Well, don't have your kids watch Rey Mysterio because these Mysterios are the worst. Judgment Day comes out. As noted, they're going to announce a new member. And uh, a long story short, they call out Finn Balor. And uh, Edge says, man, I was so happy when they told them that you wanted to be the new member. Like, that's so great. And then uh, Damian Priest does his promo, and he says, you know, Edge, we learned a lot from you. And what we learned is to get rid of the excess baggage. And so we're prepared tonight to get rid of the final piece of excess baggage. And that's you, Edge. And they turn on Edge, and they beat him up, and they put him through a table and they leave him for dead. Because at the end of the day, they want to make Edge a babyface. But in fact, Edge didn't turn babyface. The Judgment Day turned heel, even though they're already heels, and they laid out Edge. 
So if you're wondering why we have no baby faces ever, well, this is classic WWE playbook right here. Omos beat Cedric Alexander in eight seconds and then was uh, confronted by the Dirty Dogs, as I noted earlier. Why? I don't have any idea. But stand up for WWE. Ezekiel beat Otis in two minutes. And then afterwards, Ezekiel, who was beaten clean by Kevin Owens at the pay-per-view, says, I want another match with Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens comes out and he's like, brother, I beat you clean at the pay-per-view. Why would I give you another match? Which is a great question. But then he decides, you know what? I will give you another match on one condition. And the one condition is you need to admit that you are Elias. And Ezekiel hems and haws, and he puts his head down, and he finally goes, you know what? My name is Elias. Kevin Owens is so happy, and he celebrates. And as he's laughing, Ezekiel says, so do I get the match? And Kevin Owens goes, yeah. And so then Ezekiel goes, well, I took a page out of your playbook. I lied. I'm actually Ezekiel, not Elias. But now Kevin Owens is trapped in his own stipulation to give this guy a match. He can't get out of this, apparently. He's trapped. His word is his bond. So they're going to have a match next week. And then the main event was Rhea Ripley, Alexa Bliss, Liv Morgan, and Dewdrop. I was hoping, because the match is good. I was thinking, man, I'm actually going to be able to just finish this report and have nothing negative to say about anything because everybody worked hard. It was a good match. I thought they all looked good. They all got a chance to shine. Rhea Ripley got the win, and I want to see Rhea Ripley versus Bianca Belair, so that's all good. But at the end of the show, after Rhea Ripley wins, she stands there with Finn Balor and Damian Priest, and they play Edge's music because of course they did. And that, my friends, is Monday Night Raw. I did it. I got it done. You did. You did indeed. Maybe a little too hard on the Riddle Miz thing. Why? A little bit. One, Maurice looks fantastic. She's oh, aging God. incredibly, incredibly well. Hey, look. Yes, her breasts are a, large. That doesn't it's make this better. A very pretty, a very pretty woman. But look, you have him. They're hyping up a show where he's a pure baby face, where he's this wacky family guy afterwards. So you have a segment to hype the show, and you have Riddle defeat this guy. Yes, there's comedy involved because it's The Miz. But then you also at least have... On the seemingly a riddle Champa match coming up, and I'm actually good with that as he gets to Roman Reigns. So I think maybe you were a little too hard on that, but yeah. I'm glad you're playing this role today, so I don't have to. <laughs> God. But yeah, there were a lot of things like the Becky Lynch thing, like repetitive ideas. I mean, pro and con of, of Edge is no Edge, and I think that's a good thing to have them away from him. With that said, how they got rid of Edge, like you mentioned earlier on, Made no sense whatsoever. And as far as Kevin Owens and Ezekiel goes, as long as Kevin Owens is out there, I'll deal with the feud. Back in a moment, Observer Live. It's ironic. Huh? It's ironic that uh, I sit here and I want to talk about NXT, and you're so anti-NXT every week. But you are literally exactly what they're looking for. Well, let's put on about? a bad program. But what? you know what? We'll have good-looking women because that'll that'll, that'll that'll uh, make everything better. Wait a second. Time out. You are really, really disparaging the stardom that is Maurice. Okay, a longtime fixture on WWE programming. Do you remember, bro? Are you booking the, the tapes, Hall of Fame now? The WWE you Hall of Fame. Having the tapes of her standing there in Ohio Valley Wrestling, this woman standing out amongst a whole bunch of other women. Who knew in 2022 she would still be a relevant piece of the WWE entertaining puzzle? What in the world do you puzzle. determine as relevant? <laughs> See, look, what are a, you talking a about? A USA show called Ms. and Mrs. that Bro, they were listen. trying to push last night, which made sense. Look, you're Mike, acting. Mike. There was a lot of bad on that show. I think you're taking that segment and making a mountain out of a molehill. They're doing it. Miz got embarrassed. Watch his stupid show with his wife after this show, and then watch Riddle face off against Ciampa, which will probably be a pretty damn good wrestling match. Listen, I'm not saying anything. I'm sure Maurice is the greatest mom, sweet, <laughs> wonderful woman, dude. Yes. But if it doesn't matter whether they're on the show or not, they're not relevant. 
It was it there makes to no to, difference whether she's on the there, show or not. It was there to hype their show afterwards. Miz that and doesn't misses. mean it's she's a good misses. segment. So you have her on the show to get Miz embarrassed. She's there. I gotta move on. Riddle wins. This is not that difficult. I gotta move on. You, my God, look at yourself. Listen, <laughs> on my on my birthday, and this is coming from the person that likes Tiffany Stratton, right? You like Tiffany Stratton, correct? Yeah, but Aren't I'm not going to sit here. I'm not sitting Aren't here saying she's relevant. Problem? My, she can't God. single-handedly make the show better. I'm not. You're taking that small piece out of there because you want to rag on me about Maurice because you hated that segment that much because you've had a long-standing love, feud with the Miz. I you love, hate the Miz. You are emotionally scarred by the Miz bro, and his successes in life. There's and nothing in pro better wrestling. than when you say something like Mi- Maurice is relevant, and then I say she's not relevant, and then you go, "Oh, she you're was, taking one part of this against second, me." Wait a you second. You said that she was relevant for the match last night. She was relevant for the segment. They are starting a new season of Miz and Mrs. So it made sense. She was out there with her man. Riddle comes out. They do their comedy BS to get to a dumb match. Bro. <laughs> you bro. hated it that much? Matt that was Riddle. the worst thing on the show to you? Matt Riddle is next in line for Roman Reigns for the WWE Undisputed <laughs> Universal title. A man, facing- a man who cannot be beaten by anybody. But Brian and the best they Look, could come up with to get there was he's going to beat Miz Brian, in a two-minute match while Miz is in his underwear. Time, that how sucks. How much time do they have to go before him and Roman? How many times will Three Roman weeks. appear? How many times is Roman going to appear on TV? You don't even know. So they're obviously doing something where in the next couple of weeks he's going to be facing off against Ciampa. Obviously, they did that. So they blew this week as a way to get him a win and a way to hype Miz and Mrs., which is a USA show that they were airing after this. It's not that difficult. I didn't say it was difficult. I said it sucked. I figured you'd still be on about Becky. I said it sucked. Tony Storm has opened up about her departure from WWE. The 26-year-old appeared on sessions with Renee Paquette. I guess it's not oral sessions anymore. Well, Spoke about what led to her departure. She said, I had some good times in WWE. It was cool at one point, and then it wasn't. It changed, and I didn't want anything to do with it. She said everything changed for her when she was moved from NXT to the main roster. My main goal in wrestling was to be on Raw or SmackDown's main roster, WWE TV. And then I got there, and I figured it out pretty soon. I realized this is just not going to work out. But also, I'm 26. I want to have a really good time in this job. I want to have a really good career. I want to enjoy part of it. And I just wasn't enjoying it for so long. I abruptly quit. I woke up that morning having no idea that I was going to quit. She also said the frequent talent releases contributed to her unhappiness. Let's face it, she said. They just fire people left, right, and center out of the blue. I could be fired next week. And then it's like, well, what's the point? It just felt very pointless, to be honest. And it's been hard to convey that, especially to fans, especially to people that just aren't in this business and will never understand. She says, I'm not mad. I'm not angry at WWE. I don't have anything against them. It just wasn't the fit. I'm sure they got bigger fish to fry than me. Why did they care? People get let go from that place constantly. People move around constantly. doesn't matter if I'm there, but what matters is I'm not having a very good time. The day she quit, she said it was a complicated ordeal. I had built up frustrations with the place for a very long time, like a lot of people do. They don't give an S, so why should I? This isn't going to work. I know what's going to happen here. I'm just going to get sent back to catering again. I'm not going to succeed here. I'm such a kid, and I'm such a newbie, and this, that, and the other. But I like to think I've been around wrestling long enough to know. I just know what's right and what's wrong for me. And what I like and what I don't like. And just didn't like it in the end. I didn't feel appreciated. Felt like they, at times, didn't have very much respect for me. I feel like over time, they've crushed my love for wrestling. It just wasn't even wrestling anymore. You're not even allowed to say wrestling. I thought my whole purpose in life was to go to WWE. And over time, I realized it's just pro wrestling that I love. It's not a company that I love. Listen. Man, sounds like me talking about you. There's two types of people wrestlers in this world okay if you're of one type you're gonna do totally fine in wwe if you're of the other type you ain't gonna make it okay 
And we've seen this from person after person after person after person. If you really care, you ain't going to make it. And actually, the best person to talk about this was uh, Ali. Because Ali, after returning, was pretty much pressed on, bro, all you do is talk about how horrible this is, blah, 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 blah. You went home, and now you came back. And you know what he said? He said, I finally had to come to the realization that I cared too much. I cared so much, and that's what led to everything that happened. Once it came to the point where, like, bro, don't care so much about this. Just go out there and do your job, and it doesn't matter and just get your paycheck, make your money. Now he's, I, I mean, apparently a little better with it. He's on TV. But uh, I always hear people... 17 pieces of flair on. I always hear people talking about Asuka and Shinsuke Nakamura. And uh, I have talked to many people about Asuka and Shinsuke Nakamura. You know what they have in, in common? I mean this, and, and, you know, I don't want to speak for them or whatever, but uh, for the sake of argument... They don't care. Asuka has a family, and she goes to work, and she makes her money. Be fair about it. They have completely different points of reference, though, at that point in their careers, what they, in the missions they had when they came over. But this is my point. Shinsuke Nakamura loves to go to the beach and surf, and he's getting paid a lot of money to go to the beach and surf and hang out with his kids. And he doesn't care if he's the champion. He doesn't care if he's a main eventer. If he's in a main event... If he wins a title, that's great. He's happy with it, but he's not going to sit there. And Asuka's not going to sit there and, oh, I was in a championship match on pay-per-view, but I lost. Ah, I want to get out of here. No, dude, she's happy. She's fine. She's uh, providing for her family. And if she gets a pay-per-view main event, if she makes some extra money, that's great. But she's not mad about it the way that the fans are mad about it. And there are people that are very passionate about this business, and they ain't going to make it. Because this is not the place to work if you're very passionate about logic and this and that and the other thing. And it's fine if you're not. Wait, wait, wait. You can be passionate about that, but also be in full understanding, and people have to find that balance. I think an example of that, I think, for a long time was Chris Jericho going up there, reinventing himself, understanding that he would be out there and doing nonsense things, and obviously he probably looks at himself different, maybe looked at his career differently than other people. He was doing stuff so early on with WCW, but, like, he took his stuff seriously, but then still also knew he had to deal with Vince, and that's just part of the system. Some people are going to succeed in that system. Some people aren't. Some people are wired like Kevin Nash, who are, you know, slam dunks to be successes in that type of world, and other people are... But, you know, as you say, Bret Hart, terrible example, because it was a little bit of a different time. But then there's people like, again, the Kenny Omegas who would never succeed there, would never be able to deal with Vince. Vince would never be able, in all likelihood, to deal with him. It just would not be a good fit. Some people are better suited for other places. But while you are going to be there, you do under have to understand what you signed up for and the magic that you see on TV and all that sort of stuff, something... It, it doesn't work that way there. At let least me, not right now. Let me clarify this not caring thing. Because obviously, many people there care. Because you don't go out there to have great matches if you don't care. But you have to selectively care. Have a, a great example. Pride. Have pride. A great example is, is Riddle. You know why Riddle is where he is right now? Why? Riddle is where he is because he's going to do whatever they ask and he's never going to complain and he's never going to argue it and he's going to smile and if they tell him to wrestle with his underwear on his head he's going to do it and he's going to go out there and he's going to do his best with everything that he's given that's the passion that you need to succeed in wwe but if your passion is dude why like becky's a great example if becky's going to get mad about everything that i talked about on the raw report today this is not the place for her if, if she's going to point out that, dude, I had the match won, but the pin was stole, so why aren't I in the multi-woman match at the end of the show? Why am I losing to Dana Brooke in a 20... 20- if that's your attitude, bro, you ain't going to make it. But if your attitude is, well, this is stupid, but you know what? I'm going to have a really entertaining segment when I lose this 24-7 title match to Dana Brooke. Then you will succeed. That's... 
That is the story of WWE. That's Becky, what you, Becky yes. and Seth right now in their wacky clothes. Yeah. I mean, look at what Seth probably thought what he was going to be when he first stepped foot into, you know, not OVW or you know, first stepped foot into the performance center and now see what he's doing. And he will, I guarantee, argue the same way Becky has, and we've heard her do that, of why they're doing what they're doing. And do you think that they take their wins and losses? I'm sure they take them seriously to a point. But do you think Becky was walking out or throwing a fit over losing to Dana Brooke? Not in the same way we are that most people watching probably were. Hell in a Cell, Go Home, SmackDown, 1.9 million viewers, up 3.2% from the previous week. Led all uh, network programming with a .47 in 18 to 49. Rampage, on the other hand, in its normal time slot, 475,000 viewers. It was still up 40% from the previous week, but uh, .14 in 18 to 49, 14th on the cable charts. They were going head-to-head with the NHL playoff game, which did 2.3 million viewers. So this number is not good, but uh, as usual, you know, one not good number has led to people on the Internet losing their minds and uh, proclaiming the death of AEW. It's going to take, A, a few weeks for people to get in the habit of the normal time slot again, and also there was competition. So, yes, the number is bad. Is it an indication that the show is dead? No, it's going to take some time for uh, it to settle in and wherever it's going to settle in at without... NHL, NBA, et cetera, et cetera, uh, preemptions. Uh, but uh, certainly the first number, not a great number. That's, they desperately uh, need consistency, and they'll need live shows, and they'll need names like Punk and Danielson on that show once they get the NBA and NHL playoffs out of the way, at least until baseball comes after them. I got a moment, Observer Live. Our favorite show is on tonight, everybody. NXT 2.0, the mm. follow-up to uh, In Your House. And boy, was I in my house that day. I've been for a while now. Hopefully hopefully tomorrow it's the big uh, big negative test. I'm sick of this. Is your nurse coming over to administer that test? What, you think she has COVID? You can't come in this room. Well, Do you know anything about isolation? Do you know anything about the English language? What the word isolation means? Anyway... Roxanne Perez, Tiffany Stratton, NXT Breakout Tournament Finals. Josh Briggs versus Von Wagner. Oh, boy. Still one of my favorite, legitimately favorite NXT names. That's a great name. And uh, in the battle of not great names, Tatum Paxley faces Elbow Fire. Uh, Well. All on the show tonight. At least there's Tiffany Stratton and Roxy. That'll That'll be fine. I hope. I hope. I mean, well, I can't promise anything on this show. It's true. And keep in mind, by the way, they announced the breakout uh, tournament finals for, uh... by the way, is that the best name in the middle of COVID, a breakout tournament? But anyway, yeah. they announced that it would be happening last week, and then it didn't. So uh, none of these matches are guaranteed for tonight, everybody. I was hoping it was on the In Your House. I was very disappointed that it was not, although we did get a promo out of the two, which that made me laugh. No, I don't know about if Katana Chance is going to be on the show tonight. <laughs> it could have at least been Kanata Chance, so she could use that in promos. You think you're going to win the tag titles tonight? Kanata Chance! We're out of time. I've lost it. Thanks to Mike, as always, callers and listeners over the studio. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.